Tune grin. It is back. It's what you've been waiting for. The laughs, the cries, the absolute mayhem. And it has returned as it tackles a movie so utterly loathed, repulsed, and rejected by the sensible populace. Yes, it is time for a deep look at Jimmy Screamer Clouses, where the dead go to die. And the one man who will bring this film to light. A man unshaken by such horrid imagery. A man resolved to view such putrid stories. A man that will... Calm down. I mean, jeez, Harold. This is just a bad movie. We don't need to blow our load so soon with our return. Ugh. I was trying to add some high class to this review, why boy. And I thought you wanted this review to be good. My bad. Yeah, stop bullying on your limp dick the scale far. What? what? The vanilla? I wasn't bullying. Uh, yes, obnoxious? Uh, I just wanted to be included. Perfect. Anyone else like to interrupt now? I, my name is Smolder the Dragon, and I just like I want to know, I like rainbows. That is all. I wasn't being literal, Smolder. I was being facetious. What does Poe have to do with Smolder's rainbows? What? No, no, no. He was talking about feces, obviously. Ew. Oh, my. Can you please not encourage them? Can I say something? No! No! Let's start again. Hi, I'm Wyboy. Harold the Devil. Vanilla. Oh, Sprinklot. Smolder! Obnoxious! And this is our head writer, Puppet. And we all just want to say, welcome back to Cartoon Corner. Now with that much buildup, you are probably wondering... What are you talking about? No, I... I... Well, it's just another in the long line of worst movies ever that's popular in internet culture. Just to list a few of the people who've reviewed this movie. Smolder? Anima D, Amanda, Hagen, Dembo, Wiki, Marong, Mr. Enter, Hot Dog, Get Vendor, Sir Hello, Murpaka, Utubak, Bob Jones, Kenji Mazova, and quite a few other YouTubers that you never heard of. Yay! And I was there to review this by my reviewing associate, Jamboriki, who had some choice words for this thing. I don't think that this movie intellectually stimulated me. It just made me feel bored, uncomfortable, or bummed out. It's basically 90 minutes of character suffering and boring monologues. There's some interesting creativity behind it, but it's all executed in an incompetent, immature, and tasteless way. And this is all from the mind of Jimmy Screamer Claus, who I can only assume is the black sheep of the Santa Claus family. Okay, I'm being facetious. Gotta try and make some funny jokes, cause the laughs are gonna stop soon. Screamer Claus is a pseudonym Jimmy uses as before animation he was known for his music. And after sampling some from one of his hit collections, Maggot Infested Sex Holes. Just by the name. 
masterpiece. It's very tonally similar to Where the Dead Go to Die. Jimmy's music style can be best described as electronic with a heavy dose of darkness and fucked up attitude. So we can already get the audience that's into this sort of stuff. The people who cheer when unlikable age get axed in horror movies. Like Nero. Ax that bitch! And stop right there, Vanilla. Uh, blah? I get the knee-jerk reaction to call these people messed up for liking this sort of stuff, but hey, as long as it hurts nobody, who gives a crap what gives them a rush of adrenaline? Uh, I was actually going to ask when you were going to start the actual reveal part of this damn reveal. Oh? Oh. Oh. Um. Um. Very good. Back on track then. Scream Clones has garnered a bit of a cult following over the years and has moved from music to short films and animations, which also consisted of his trademark themes of surrealism, which all coming in today's film where the dead go to die. Is it as bad as the critics say? Do I have anything new to bring to the table? And isn't Screamer Claus the coolest name for a Santa Claus themed death metal band? Let us find out all the answers to these very important questions as we endure where the dead go to die. This cover just brings up too many questions. Why is there a Cyclops missile show on the back? Is that a nurse from Silent Hill who I believe has a testicle forehead? What's with this guy in the middle who is praying and made of delicious crispy bacon? And tentacles too? Is this a hentai now? But in a weird way, this cover truly does complement the movie. Because if you see the cover, you'll have no idea what to make of it. Except things will get weird. And if you see the movie, you'll have no idea what to make of it. Except for a feeling like this. Now as the opening credits roll, you can already tell why this movie got the crown of worst animation ever. The animation looks like sending Gary's mob would crap out if they were, oh, I don't know, listening to Screamer Klaus. Bland lifeless stares, stiff body motion, and inconsistent set designs makes the movie look like it stars lifeless dolls being animated on a CGI sex animation software. And to be fair, there's been other projects that have used the same sex animation software and look far better. And wow, he's dead. But he looks great. Right is the ring of words when the right man rings them. That was animated in Poser. You're welcome. Thankfully I got animation out of the way, because the movie has bigger issues to tackle. First off, this isn't your run-of-the-mill A to B story, kids, no. This had to be an anthology movie made up of three short films, solely produced by Mr. Bloodbaghead. Yay. And our anthology starts with Tainted Milk, the story of a boy named Tommy, who is staring out blankly into the particle effect rain, wondering if that's what rain is supposed to look like, when he asks his mother a question. Hey, Mom? What is it, Tommy? Where did babies come from? Your vagina, silly! Oh, so how can my voice be any more seriously than yours? Now, the actors may sound like they've recited their lines after being dropped down a flight of stairs, but at least they give good sex ed advice. Babies? You want to know about babies, do you? Well, I'll tell you all about babies. Babies come from the mistakes you made as a child. From marrying your high school sweetheart who you would think would know how to use a Fucking diaphragm. See, with dialogue like that, you'll never want to have sex ever again. So Tommy's living the crappy life with his parents constantly arguing about their inability to use condoms and diaphragms. So Tommy just heads to school. With some whimsical musical accompaniment. Oh boy, what magical adventures will we go on today with our talking dog, Labby? God sent me to tell you that, that the child living inside of your mother is, is the Antichrist. We, we 
must kill it, Tommy. Labby, that's just messed up. Labby is a real oddity in this movie. I never really got what Labby was supposed to be. Is he a messenger of some sort of god like he initially says he is? Or is he just some sort of demon who works alongside the minstrel show to screw with people? Either way, I think we can agree that the dog's panting is super creepy. I'm, I'm, I'm only his messenger. <laughs> Heaven is just a fantasy you dream about. Do you really believe that? <laughs> oh, no, wait, no, I got that wrong. I meant super stupid. Just get the dog some water for God's... Um, Satan's sake? Yeah, Satan's sake, yeah. So Wabby has come around to tell Tommy about how his unborn brother will be born to be the Antichrist. Yeah, this... This is the way things are headed. So the explanation to why Tommy's brother will be the Antichrist is that God filled women's breasts with only enough holy breast milk for one child. Wonderfully demonstrated by this baby tonguing his mother's nipple. And all other milk that the woman produces henceforth will become tainted milk, thanks to the devil. Or as Labby puts it, Tainted. Yeah, might as well let Labby contain the explanation, because I can't give it j j j justice do, do you even know where... where where babies come from, T Tommy? No, I tried to ask my parents, but they wouldn't tell me. They come from the Shadow Men. Shadow Men? Oh, but it gets weirder. God's way of taking them to heaven. Yeah, because just letting them pass peacefully and painlessly in their sleep isn't metal enough for this god. But, but this makes the devil angry. Oh, uh, no, Labby. You see, this is the devil. That is the bacon devil. But you're just satanically confused. But don't worry, I don't blame you. The anime has to us, but it'll throw anybody off. Wander around angry and jealous of, of, of the living. They move under the beds of couples, wait, waiting for them to, to procreate. They will sneak into the lady's tummy and, and take over the newly created fetus, tur turning it evil. So then the movie's explanation for the procreation of an evil baby is this. <laughs> um, I'll just let that sit there. <laughs> Tommy too is unsure of Labby's ironclad evil baby making narrative, citing that the lady in the well warned him about this. But how could you not trust Labby? with his satanic red eyes and constantly sounding like he's jacking off to his own evil. So Tommy takes Labby to his house where Labby has a talk with his parents about the baby. getting a divorce, why are they sleeping naked in the same bed together? Oh, yeah, the, the baby thing, um, uh, yeah, let's just let the scene finish first. You fucking dog! What the fuck? What are you some sort of faggot? You know, you just gotta really admire the direction Jimmy gave here. So a dog is biting your dick off. It's the most excruciating pain that a man can experience. React like you just stubbed your toe. Cannibal, you're eating my dick! Genius. What's even better than that is despite doing this horrible thing, aka covering the family in bacon textures, Labby is still looking out for Tommy. Quickly. Looks like he attacked you first. 
Are you proposing to make forensic countermeasures to push the story that the forcibly aborted baby brother attacked first? Josiah was standing our ground. Works on real life. So Tommy quite understandably goes insane and, uh, yep, this is some random imagery. Means nothing though as we have no idea outside of the dog killed my parents what Tommy's character is. If we did, this might actually be disturbing rather than just random bacon blood covered images. Oh, and now these jerks show up. No, but I would have expected somebody who held Mr. Screamer Claus during production to tell him what the feather tool was. Ah, one of the many seizure moments with ear-piercing screams added to the audio. Yeah, we'll keep the remaining of these outside of the review. Just so I don't end up hurting somebody. Seriously, this hurts my eyes and ears. After waking up from his acid trip, Tommy goes to talk to the lady of the well to tell it about his troubles. Acting as though his parents took away his Nintendo, and you know, not like they were viciously murdered by a dog. Who are you? Follow me. Let me show you something. Woo! He's Mr. Tattooed Bacon Face, the loved hero and protector of children. You know, if you get sweaty and want to take your shirt off, that'd be just fine. So Mr. Baconface shows Tommy Sunface Jesus here, and tells him how there's some sort of ancient battle going on between him and Sunface Jesus. Failing to see how that relates to Tommy, he then says he'll be able to grant him his wish to bring his parents back to life. Now don't worry, we all know Tommy is too smart to just believe Mr. Baconface here. He looks too evil with his morphing face. Obviously, Tommy's gonna take the word of Labby. You know, the dog who killed his parents and plucked his unborn brother out of his mother like one would take a sock out of a hamper. Yeah, that makes sense. And to bring Tommy's parents back, Labby says he just needs to sacrifice something. His virginity. Which virginity, why boy? Well, Smolder, I can't really show you the scene to properly demonstrate it, but I can play the audio, and I can also use these toys as visual aids. This one will be Labby, this one will be Tommy, and this one will be Tommy's mommy's dead body. You ready, kids? Let's learn! <gasps> Maybe I was a little bit too visual with that. And what do you know, fucking a dog as it fucks your dead mother? Ah uh, jeez, that ain't gonna go well in the comments. Didn't bring Tommy's parents back to life, so Tommy is left with nothing. And Tommy just sort of teleports to his dead baby brother, and he gives him a hug, closing out the first story like this was some deeply emotional moment. <laughs> <laughs> And that was story one. Now while Tainted Milk had some issues balancing its comedy and darker elements, Let's Hope story number two, Liquid Memories, has a bit more focus on what it wants to be. I killed myself the other day. Ah, oh, good. You picked boredom for your focus this time. So our seemingly still alive protagonist, it's hard to tell with the corpse-like stare and the oscar worthy acting chops, recounts his tale of when he murdered one of the cast for Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, but who can really blame him? Those skin-tight jeans are nothing to be mocked. And Skinny Jeans exposes that when he kills someone, he extracts a nice blueberry Kool-Aid from the base of their necks, which if you inject it to yourself, you'll be able to overwrite your memories at will. In this case, Skinny Jeans wants to use that to erase memories of death from his life to... As he puts it... I'm currently using this technique to delete 
any memories that I have of death so that I can better understand what it is that we have forgotten over time. Oh my god. The only thing shocking this shock gore flick is how I've been able to stay awake this long. So this crazy psychopath is the work of the minstrel show again, who seems to be using him to gather sacrifices for them to open a rift into our world. But whether that is actually what is going on is up in the air, as all we get from our oh-so-reliable narrator is... I try to befriend it while it's here, but it never accepts me. I offer it a sacrifice. It doesn't take it. Well, maybe you should have put more fun to your sacrifices towards us, Hellspawn. I mean, really, crappy blood of effects. It just looks like jam. It's like you don't even think I'm pretty anymore. But then we got from the morose whack job to a hooker giving a veteran a whack job. <sighs> In the bushes, Or like job? I. I I, I guess that's a thing that somebody can get off to. In the bushes, oh, yeah, baby. Rub that rust off. Make it look brand new. Uh, uh. Right. Get it down! <laughs> And it seems like craziness isn't exclusive to the morose, as the veteran seems to go through a post-traumatic war flashback where... So, either this is an over-the-top racist equivalency, or the movie just doesn't care. Well, with that, the veteran goes instantly crazy and gaps out one of the hooker's eyeballs. <laughs> oh, you jerk! And I was gonna give you a discount on the leg job. My jobs are worth double. God! So the hooker gets away to this church that's the size of a big doghouse, where nothing bad will happen to her. Anything involving tentacles and a girl has to end good, right? <laughs> Well, that answer would be no, as Skinny Jean slashes up Hooker and gets more Kool-Aid from her, rambling off some morose monologue about how he's now the closest he's ever been to falling in love, after slitting her throat and giving her a slow, agonizing death. Ya yeah, no, love. So Skinny Jean's got what he wanted, more Kool-Aid. So what happens next? 20 minutes of nothing but gore! No, 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 that's the Star Trek gore. I'm talking about gore porn. Help, can you help me out to teach this? Hello there, my little trauma patients to be. Harold here to teach you all about gore. As you can gather from the name, gore is a portmanteau of porn and gore. And like porn, its primary function isn't meant to make you really give a poo about the story or characters. You're just supposed to care about the actors screwing like rabbits to excite and thrill you. Gore is similar to this, but uses extremely graphic gore to excite and thrill its audience. Think of films like Cabin Fever and the later Saw movies. On a very base level, the key selling point of these movies is watching its victims get horribly mangled. Now, if I don't add an addendum here, Vanilla will shove a troll rage dildo up my butt. Yeah, oh well. And I wouldn't be against it, but like some porn can have good plot and characters, so can gone movies as well. For example, Silent Hill uses the idea of grotesque torture to push the idea of punishment and anguish, which is the theme of the movie. However, where the dead goes die isn't even close to being in that category. And just has it to be shock value gore porn, as opposed to being a natural portion of the overall story. This has been a learning experience with Harold. See, this whole sequence is more an exercise in showing Skinny Jesus' punishment for wanting to erase his memories of death. Oh, and bacon blood textures and everyone's head looking like testicles or langoliers if you ever saw that movie. Now, 
Why should we care to watch Skinny Jeans' as punishment? From what I gather, the point is to watch and be excited or thrilled by how Skinny Jeans is being tortured for his horrible crimes. But here's the thing. Unlike in better gore and horror flicks, where maybe a crew of teens go somewhere to party, and the audience is excited to see their annoying faces be silenced in the most bloody way possible, Skinny Jeans is way too boring for that. I don't find him irritating, disgusting, repugnant, or any other real negative emotion. At the pace the movie goes, I just wanted to get the next scene to get closer to the ending credits. Because it's boring. Hmm, that wasn't really funny. Let's take the piss out of some of the stupider moments, shall we? And there's a cat thing. How do you throw a dog off your scent? Got this bottle of bleach from the 3D printer. Dog's high on bleach. Oh, he's eating his own guy. <laughs> that was sad, but... This is a good way to wrap up my remaining thoughts on the horrible of this segment. <sighs> this is a real endurance test, mostly to stay awake. But we're finally on segment number 3, the masks that the monsters wear. Meet the last of our three poor souls, Ralph, a boy born with his Siamese stillborn brother growing on his face. And because his parents are horrible people, they treat Ralph like an abomination, forcing him to wear a mask and even refusing any sort of medical treatment for him when his brother starts causing Ralph to have seizures and see hallucinations. Or maybe they just don't trust hunchbacks to do the surgery right. You judge. God has a divine plan for all of us. And we must not intervene. Or maybe it's a continuation of this movie's theme of religious beliefs being used for horrible things. You know, like how some people do in real life. Now Screamer Calls has said in an interview that this use of religion in his shorts is less to make a sort of statement like religion is bad, but more to mock and criticize the religious extremists, lampooning how they can perceive their views to do terrible things. Actually, the interview about the movie is far more interesting than the actual movie. The interview showed that Jim had put some major thought into the ideas he wanted to visualize. However, in the movie, that criticism doesn't come across and just feels like religion is bad. This is because the only people we interact with are the extreme views who misuse religion. And because of being a bad conflict, we aren't able to have that time to show the dichotomy of two different religious views to compare as we're focused on the negative and only the negative aspects of religion. I will say though, this critical look on religion is much more prevalent in this last story as Ralph is more shown to be the innocent youth stuck in a terrible situation as his religious parents abuse him verbally and weirdly physically. Don't you think your brother is hungry too? He doesn't have his own hands to feed himself. Don't toy with your brother like that! Nope! But don't worry folks, that mild praise I gave is pretty quickly thrown out, as this segment is best described as both bore-tastic, and for the unprepared, despicable. Not only do we have some more boring corn to deal with, which by now you'll feel desensitized to, but this is a love story. Uh, nope. Between Ralph and the girl across the street, Sophia, Ralph is all enamored with Sophia and decides to get closer to her by getting on her dad's good side. Uh, but from how Hillbilly Dad looks, I don't think he has one. So Hillbilly Dad or Hill Daddy gives Ralph, or better put, sells Ralph a $50 VHS tape of Sophia Cult. Oh no. Pedophilia, huh? Hmm. Hey Harold, you wanna fill in on this one? You know what? No. Wow. If you can make Harold quit, then you done fucked up. So Ralph obviously traumatized by seeing his crush sexually assaulted like that and being out 50 bucks, goes to Hilly to ask what the fuck? 
Hill Daddy lies though saying everything is cool. He even tells Ruff to watch it again and Ruff does and seems to enjoy it this time. Ugh. What are you doing? <gasps> Nothing, Dad. No, I swear. You better not be touching yourself. Remember, it's not just your cock you're jerking off, it's also your brother's. And I refuse to have a faggot for a son. Jimmy, was there like a checklist you had of all the taboo subjects you want to cram into 40 minutes? Now we got Sophia's horrible family life to spotlight, as Hill Daddy is yelling at her for crying during the video. Johnny? Yeah, Dad? Get Sophia her mask. Fucking tears from your face. What the fuck is the matter with you, you fucking bitch? Why can't you just fucking act right? Oh god, it's gonna get more real stuff, isn't it? Okay, okay. I'm ready. Come on, you've been showing fucked up imagery since the DVD cover, but this is the most horrific child abuse scene you can think up? It looks plain goofy! But you know what, by this time Klaus has really given up on trying to engage me on an intelligence level, so screw it, rapid fire story time kids! Ralph starts becoming more enamored with the Lady of the Well and Labby once again, showing more clearly the Lady is actually good and Labby is an asshole who'll make you fall in a pit of eyeballs. At least Labby sets it straight to Ralph that Sophia is not alright. Labby actually phrases her situation in a way that is more profound and not pseudo-intellectual drivel like skinny jeans. But wait! That for the rest of her life, she, she'll think the bad touch is what love feels like. So, so she'll seek it out with as many people as possible. It will never feel right. Is the hooker supposed to be Sophia? Huh. That sort of creates a narrative connection between the shorts that I didn't notice before. Neat! It also destroys any stakes in this story because if she becomes the hooker in Liquid Memories, that means that whatever Ralph does to help her will not work guaranteed. That's a bitch, ain't it? Now Sophia starts to like Ralph too, bringing him to her secret garden next to the well, where the Lady of the Well is revealed to be a harpy that lives at the bottom of it. I guess it's supposed to be an angel or something? Maybe a symbol of our deep-rooted nature to be good. This is my garden. Come here. I want to show you something. It's beautiful, isn't it? My mistake. If there was any such thing as deep-rooted good, then I probably killed it by putting this movie on. Well, that was a swell day for Ralph. He made the girl he likes happy. They frolicked. She touched his brother. A perfect day. Um, morons, do you realize that by strangling Ralph, you're kind of killing the son that you love? This seems to have been the final push Ralph needed, as that good-natured boy who wanted to help has now been totally corrupted, and goes to see Sophia to act in one of her videos.
You know, I've watched many movies and TV shows from my reviews, and I've acted super happy, sad, and all sorts of other crap. But this, this was the first time watching this scene that I felt utterly disgusted. Utterly disgusted. Like, knots making in my stomach. Wanting to be sick. That disgusted. But this, this movie, by this point, is far gone from being called Gorn. It's something like entirely different. I, I wouldn't even know what to even call it. Because it's not trying to excite you. It's not trying to make you get a rush of adrenaline from the act of seeing people getting chopped up. It's trying to disgust you. It's trying to pull up that darkness deep inside you with these dark imagery. Just trying to pull that out so you get to see the true disgusting nature of the mind, of what it can produce. And whether that's the intention of the scene or not, it's not really what I'm here to debate. I'm just here to just give my thoughts on it. And, in a way, it, this makes this movie almost brilliant, in a way, of how disgusted I become. And also makes it reprehensibly awful. Afterwards, Ralph loses his connection to the lady in the well, and more importantly, Sophia shows she has now shattered. Not caring how she receives love anymore, but will just accept what she can so she can't be hurt. And Ralph, realizing his mistake, shatters too, and kills his father, mother, and Sophia's father and client. Thus ends Ralph's story of self-destruction, soon to be engulfed by his negative feelings and becoming tattooed bacon face man, and aligned with the Shadow Men for all eternity. I know after that long rant I had, you might be expecting me to go off screaming to high heaven about how horrible this movie is. But I honestly feel something different. Jimmy did a terrible job with this anthology, failing to grasp narrative, tone, or even simple design aesthetic to get across his point. However, deep down, I feel Jim's ideas are sound. Tainted Nook was developed to give it a bipolar feeling while watching. Liquid Memories displays an interesting moral dilemma of a man trying to become okay with death by blocking his own past horrors. And Mask the Monsters Wear doesn't make me feel for any of the characters, but I can see that core idea. The love story between a broken boy and girl, the horror that their parents may inflict on them, and the resulting terrors that it gives rise to. All these ideas have strong roots. They're just not executed well, and the animation holds those ideas back, making all the visuals, monologues, and boring bullshit seem like it's from the diary of a 14-year-old goth. If the style and writing were focused, constant, and knew what it wanted to speak, I think Klaus could actually put something that's both surreal and well thought out. Where the Dead Go to Die, however, might find its audience with Gorn lovers who will like them out their visuals and are alright with a more tonally inconsistent narrative. It's too boring for me though, so if you're someone easily disturbed or bored like me, and see Where the Dead Go to Die on DVD or Blu-ray, seriously, I say don't pick it up. It's terrifying for the wrong reasons. But hey, with my optimistic view of Jimmy, I'm actually sort of looking forward to Jimmy's new movie, When Blackbirds Fly. Will he have learned from his mistakes from Where the Dead Go to Die and improved upon? I'll find out for myself sometime. But these are all just learning experiences. This with me and my reviews and him and his movies. We're all just trying to go out there to strive to be the best that we can be. And I'm just going to be optimistic and say that we can both be, like, completely awesome someday. Uh, well, this was the first episode of the new season of Cartoon Corner. And what a way to start off. But there's plenty more fun episodes along the way. So, if you like what you saw today, 
and be sure to tune in next time for more Cartoon Corner. And I'm sure everyone else will be back. Hopefully. Hello? Guys? I, I'm, I'm kind of all alone here. Hello? Wait a minute, where do the dead go to die anyways?